The Republic of the Floridas, also known as the Republic of Florida, was a short-lived effort to make an independent Florida. Interestingly enough, by this point it was the fourth republic to pop up in Spanish Florida. The previous were the Republic of West Florida, the Republic of East Florida, and the state of Muskogee. To add to this confusion was the fact that the Republic of East Florida was also called the Republic of Florida. This Republic of the Floridas was in reference to the colonies of East and West Florida. The Republic was also called the Republic of Floridas because we needed even more names. The Republic of East Florida used a flag known as the Green Cross of Florida. Here it is. The name is self-explanatory. The entrepreneur behind this was a Scottish general, a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. He was Sir General Gregor MacGregor. In 1816, being stirred up and inspired by the rebellions of the Spanish colonies across the New World, at the age of 25, he set off to Caracas in Venezuela. He joined the army of Simon Bolivar. He shrewdly noticed the weak Spanish grasp on Florida and the burgeoning imperialist territorial ambition of the United States. He hoped to wrest Florida from Spain and to encourage the people to join the United States. Now, McGregor was not doing this just for his own sake, but for monetary gain. He hoped to sell the Floridian lands at a good price. In fact, Secretary Adams presumed that if the prices weren't good enough for McGregor, and I quote, there's some reason to suppose that he had made indirect overtures of similar nature to the British government. Despite this, his confidence and military record made finding support amongst his travels across the US coast easy, without even mentioning the secretly covetous attitude the US government had towards Florida. For example, a group of Savannah merchants assisted financially for the expedition after agreeing to buy 30,000 acres of Florida for $1 an acre. Among the recruits were sons of well-to-do families of Charleston, the War of 1812 veterans, and the majority of those with more mercenary tendencies. Sir General McGregor decided he would use artillery to soften up the enemy ranks what this book describes as a pioneering move in psychological warfare, General McGregor sent a disguised agent to mingle with the troops garrisoned at Fort San Carlos to spread rumors about a formidable army of 1,000 men and the likely helplessness of the fort's small garrison. This was so effective that half the residents fled. All this despite the fact McGregor only had 150 men and only used 55 musketeers for the initial attack. The attack began June 29, 1817, when General McGregor parked five ships at the harbor for show. He then approached the fort under the cover of forests and creeks. He deployed 55 men in groups of two or three, all converging from around the fort to give the appearance of being the advance guard of a much larger force. Within the fort was frightened commander Francisco Morales, who surrendered and signed McGregor's articles of capitulation, all without a single shot being fired. At St. Augustine, the Spanish governor Jose Copinger was enraged at Colonel Morales' surrender, but he put him in chains, court-martialed, and sentenced him to death, though the execution was commuted. Mrs. Susan Langle, an inhabitant of the fort wrote that McGregor and his men took residence in the homes the locals abandoned, with McGregor taking up the finest residence. General McGregor promised to protect the remaining residents and allow the others to return and sell their property if they didn't want to join the Standard of Independence and hoisted the Green Cross of Florida over the fort. By this point, General McGregor's funds had been severely depleted so his newfound Floridian Republic turned to more questionable sources of income. This is where the cracks in his plan begin to show, such as the general letting pirates take harbor in Fernandina and even hiring privateers to prey upon Spanish vessels. He ignored the plundering of plantations along the St. John's River of property and slaves by his men to then be sold for the Floridian treasury. Without a steady income to pay for soldiers, supplies, and operations, 
his forces began to dwindle from desertions. Meanwhile, a militia of settlers alongside the Spanish plotted an attack on McGregor. The militia Spanish attack was on September 10th. General McGregor already delegated command to two assistants and went to his ship in the harbor, ready to depart upon defeat. There were about 300 men on the Spanish side, with 80 poorly motivated defenders on the Floridian side. So upon the first round of the attack, the defenders were forced back into the fort. Now the attackers lingered and did not press the attack nor their advantage to ensure swift victory. Despite this, the defenders within the fort were certain of defeat and began to haphazardly fire shells over the fort and into the air. Now a miracle occurred for them when one of the stray shells landed in the midst of the attacking militia and threw them into a panic. The commanding Spanish major ordered a full-scale retreat to the disbelief of the men in the fort. This book I read states, the green crosses won by freak accident. I wouldn't know a more apt way to put it. Despite this victory, McGregor knew the end was in sight for his Republic of the Floridas. The men were wild and unstable due to meager rations and no pay for several weeks. The treasury was debt-ridden. But a few days later, the French privateer Luis Ari sailed into Amelia Harbor. McGregor sold him the fort, its arms, and properties for $50,000. Over a million dollars in today's money. It was enough to pay his men, the debts of the Republic, and of course, to no one's surprise, a modest profit. Under the control of Luis Ari, it became a den of piracy. It was the slave smuggling that forced the United States' hand into landing 200 men on the island. Ari protested, but surrendered the island to U.S. forces on December 23, 1817. Secretary John Quincy Adams remarked that the Spanish governor of East Florida, Jose Maria Copinger, if Spain could have protected her own territory, the U.S. would not have to do it for her. That may have been the end of the Republic of the Floridas, but there was no end for General Gregor McGregor. After this, in 1818, he tried to take over Tampa Bay. He took over a few Caribbean islands occasionally, and took over Puerto Bello in Nicaragua. And from the natives there, he was able to get 8 million acres, where he soon fashioned himself His Highness Gregor Cacique of the Poyai. That is a story on its own, for it was a fictional country devised as a scheme. He died in 1845 in Caracas, Venezuela, receiving pensions. For me, Florida is the Wild West of the 1810s, how a party of men could take over an island and proclaim dominion over an entire territory. Even more awe-inspiring were the twists of fate that allowed it to persist for a little while, such as their miraculous defense against the Spanish siege. I'm also amazed by how General McGregor, the troublemaker he was, essentially got off scot-free and faced no consequence for his actions. No one today could take over an island and face nothing, much less make a small profit as he did.